I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 1 in a few moments here. You can turn there. I don't really have anything new tonight, and you can be thankful for that, because if it's new, it's probably not true. So we're, we're just looking at uh, the same old glorious truths and perhaps packaged a little differently and emphasized in a, a particular way. I hope there's something that will rise to the surface of your own mind and heart that will be a help to you this evening. Believing the gospel is what I've entitled this tonight. Believing, really believing the gospel. This ordinance, the Lord's Supper, expresses the very heart of a New Testament church. It expresses the very heart of a heartbeat of a New Testament church. That's a, that's a big statement. It is a significant ordinance, one that every believer ought to be drawn to because of what is confessed in it, what is proclaimed in it. For taking together expresses the unity that we have intrinsically because we're in Christ. That is, it's a unity that we didn't put together. It's a unity that God, by His Spirit, has formed, putting us together in Christ. So it's a unity that we have, but it's a unity also that we experience. And there's where the local church context of this thing comes into view. It's a unity that we experience because of our relationship to Jesus Christ, not because of our relationship to one another first, but because of our relationship to Christ. And because of our relationship to Christ, we can have a relationship with those who aren't like us. Ones that we sort of, we, we can even rub each other, other in, in wrong ways, difficult ways, whether it be regardless of what the natural relationship is, whether it be family or not. Anyone who dwells together very long find that the other person has warts or has things about them they don't like. And of course, if they're wise, they realize they also have warts. There's also things about them that are difficult for others to deal with. But, but when we come together to partake of the Lord's Supper, we are expressing this idea of unity that we have been told to endeavor to maintain in Ephesians chapter 4. We have a responsibility in this, and so we are expressing that unity as we partake together. We are confessing corporately, not just as an individual. As you've heard me say before, you can confess individually your dependence upon Christ. You don't need to come together to do that. But we've been told to come together to do it, that we might corporately express, confess our dependence upon the righteousness and blood of Jesus Christ alone for our relationship of peace with God. We're not alone in this. Christ didn't just die for you and me. He died for a whole host of sinners. And that's what the church is. It's that it's, it's it, those individuals coming together to confess corporately what Christ has done for us. We are sinners reconciled to God by Christ alone, and that's what we are confessing together. We're doing this together. We are confessing together. That's what is so painful to me when, when individuals uh, don't see the significance of that and withdraw themselves from that. I, I don't understand that. Um, that, that's something we ought to be wanting to confess together and not staying away from that. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 26 says it this way, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show. Isn't that interesting? Every one of us have the opportunity to proclaim, show, declare, preach. That word show, it's S-H-E-W in the Old English but it's a, it's a word that's talking about a proclamation. It is a declaration. It is actually preaching. You, you, hey, ladies, you get to preach tonight. 
Sure. We, you do show the Lord's death till he come. We're declaring the gospel. Together we're doing that. And anyone who is observing is hearing in a certain way, perhaps seeing. This is the visual. This is the only visual God has given to us, really, of the death of Christ. Is right here. And, of course, the other ordinance, which is baptism. But those are the only two expressions, declarations, visually, that he has given to the church. But it's critical that we do not isolate or compartmentalize what we are proclaiming tonight from our daily lives. In other words, this is not just a religious activity that we are doing as a church, and then we forget about it as we leave. That's what I mean by isolating or compartmentalizing. We are being drawn together tonight to set our minds and hearts upon that which we ought to be setting our minds and hearts upon always. This is the, as I said, the heartbeat of the church. Always. The gospel proclaimed. You do show the Lord's death. Proclaim. Preach. That's the heartbeat of the church. The gospel proclaimed in this ordinance also must be the heartbeat of our lives every single day. The gospel. Let's think about this. The gospel. If I were to ask you, as I did someone this last, more than one this last week, but what is the gospel? I had a pastor's wife actually say this, boy, uh, you're putting me on the spot. I'm putting you on the spot? I'm asking you what the gospel is, and I'm putting you on the spot? Or I asked someone else, what is the gospel? And they both just sat there. Christians? But they just sat there and I wasn't ugly with them. I, I went in to talk to them about, I, I proceeded to tell them what the gospel is, but it's like they've been in church most of their lives and could not tell me, couldn't answer the question. The gospel. Could you? How familiar are you with the gospel? How significant is the gospel to you? If someone were to ask you, say, what is the gospel? Would you just immediately flow forth with something because it had been incubating in you? The gospel. The gospel is the message of the salvation work of God in Christ. Let's read about it here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. This is why it is important to read your Bible, by the way. It is important to continually keep these things in your mind and your heart. You know why these songwriters could write the songs they, they write that we just sang? It's, it's not because they didn't know the scriptures. It's because they probably camped in the word of God and the word of God grew within them and came forth with these poetic expressions. First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect vain. For the preaching of the cross, that word preaching there is the word, the Greek word is logos, actually. And if you're familiar with that word, it's, it's, it actually means word. And the word became flesh. That's the translation of logos. The word became flesh, logos. Here they translated, the King James translators translated it preaching because in the context here, that's what's being referred to. But you could also say the word of the cross. In other words, that the message. The word of the cross, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? 
For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching. That's not the same word that's translated preaching up in verse 18. Here in verse 21, the word preaching is is really, it's, it's, it's similar to the word to herald or to proclaim. But here it's talking about that which is preached. It's the same family of words. The foolishness of what is preached. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach. That's the same family of word that's found in verse 21 where the King James translates it preaching. But here it is the verb. We preach, we proclaim Christ crucified. The gospel, in other words. Unto the Jews, a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks, foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. So the gospel is the message of the salvation work of God in Christ. And you know, we could do a whole series of messages on what the gospel is and the various ways in which it is presented to us in Scripture. But fundamentally, it is summarized in that expression, the cross of Christ, the gospel. It is the gospel that the Scriptures tell us is the power of God. Verse 18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are Saved or are being saved, it is the power of God. It is the power of God. You find that again in Romans 1.16, don't you? For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God. Unto salvation, to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel is the power of of God. I want you to think about that. The gospel is the power of God. I hadn't realized it this way before I read something in a brief book here that's bringing attention to the gospel. And this is what this individual says. You don't know him and I don't either. But this is what he says concerning the power of God outside of heaven. The power of God in its highest density is found inside the gospel. This must be so, for the Bible twice describes the gospel as the power of God. It is the power of God. There is only one other thing referred to in that way, and that is Jesus Christ in the text that we just read, the passage we just read, Christ in verse 24, the power of God. The gospel is the power of God. Christ is the power of God. Christ crucified is the gospel, the power of God. Nothing else in all of scripture is ever described in this way except for the person of Jesus Christ. Such a description indicates that the gospel is not only powerful, but that it is the ultimate entity in which God's power resides and does its greatest work. I hope you can follow me as I read one more paragraph. Indeed, God's power is seen in erupting volcanoes, in the unimaginable hot boil of our massive sun, and in the lightning speed of a recently discovered star seen streaking through the heavens at 1.5 million miles per hour. Yet in Scripture, such wonders are never labeled the power of God. Now, we see the power of God in creation, but they're not labeled the power of God. How powerful then must the gospel be that it would merit such a title? And how great is the salvation it could accomplish in my life 
if I would only embrace it by faith and give it a central place in my thoughts each day. Now, you may kick back at that statement, but don't do so too quickly, okay? And how great is the salvation it could accomplish in my life if I would only embrace it by faith and give it a central place in my thoughts each day. The gospel is the power of God. It's the power of God unto salvation, unto deliverance. Deliverance from the guilt and condemnation of sin and the law. We know that. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation. Well, how can that be? The power of God in the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation to deliver from the power of sin to rule and to dominate. Romans 6, 4, sin shall not have dominion or power over you. How so? The power of the gospel to deliver. It is the power of God unto salvation, unto deliverance from the condemnation of sin and the law, from the power, the rule of sin in my life, and from the last enemy, which is death. I think I heard John quoting uh, Hebrews 2 yesterday out on the streets. 2.14, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had power of death, that is the devil, and deliver the salvation. Deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So the gospel is, think about it. you got to think about it. If you don't think about it, there is no believing going on. Believing and thinking go together. Okay? So don't just, don't just say, I believe that. And don't think about that. The gospel is the power of God under salvation. It is. You say, well, I don't see the power in my life. You haven't become connected with the gospel. Because the gospel is the power of God under salvation. But who is it the, who is the gospel, the power unto salvation, to Romans 116 to everyone who believes not to everyone but to everyone who believes and listen believing has a beginning for every born again sinner believing has a beginning how do you know that preacher well, verses like this, Ephesians 1 and verse 13, in whom also, he's writing to saints, he says, in whom, in whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that you believed. The tense of that verb there is an act. It has a beginning. It's punctilier, we call it. It started. You believe, you believe, and after that you believe. There's a beginning to your believing. You haven't always believed. Not in this, not in this sense. You, be, you began to believe. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You see this in Acts chapter 17. I'm giving you just a couple of examples here. Acts chapter 17. Paul is preaching in Thessalonica. In verse 2, Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days he reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. Isn't that interesting? Just like we were doing this morning, kind of reasoning out of the Scriptures. And say, well, preacher, shouldn't you have sealed the deal this morning? I mean, we had unconverted folks here. Shouldn't you have sealed the deal? You failed. And yet here's Paul, three Sabbath days he reasoned out of the Scriptures. Opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that 
this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. And then it says, some of them believed. In other words, they didn't before. But after three Sabbath days, something happened. And they believed and consorted to join together with Paul and Silas. And of the devout Greeks, a great multitude. And of the chief women, not a few. Later on in the same chapter, as, as Paul preached on Mars Hill. A challenging message. And it says in verse 32, When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Others said, We'll hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them. Howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed. Again, the tense of the verb here is that there was a beginning to this believing. Among the which was Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. There was a beginning to the believing in Acts 28 and verse 24. It says, same wording, and some believed the things which were spoken as Paul uh, taught them concerning Christ. And some believed not. So there was a distinction being made between those who believed and those who did not believe. So I... I'm not trying to say tonight that there is not a beginning to our believing. There is. And I'm not even necessarily saying you know exactly when that time was in your life. But there was a time when you did not believe and now you do believe. There was a beginning to that. Whether you can identify the moment or not is not the issue. But you didn't always. Let's just put it this way. If you have always believed, you probably haven't believed. Because there's a time where you begin to believe in, a, in relationship to Christ, the power of God, like you didn't believe before. Now, here's where it gets significant for the point tonight. Believing the gospel connects us in a very practical way with the power of God in the gospel. Believing the gospel not just having believed, but believing the gospel connects us in a very practical way with the power of God in the gospel. To unbelieving ones, the gospel is irrelevant at best. There is no power. In 1 Corinthians 1, it's referred to as foolishness, stumbling block to those who do not believe. There is no impact. Somebody who says, I believe the gospel, and yet there is no impact in their lives, I would say you do not or you are not believing the gospel. Believing ones connect with the power of the gospel. You understand, this is what God says is his power in this world, in the lives of his people. It is the gospel, the power of God. Unto salvation to everyone who believes. So believing ones connect with the power of the gospel and they are greatly impacted. You cannot truly believe the gospel and remain unreconciled to God and unaffected in life. It's not possible. How important is believing? Sometimes we shy away from emphasizing believing because it sounds like, well, that's man's work. That's what man's doing. You don't understand the scriptures if you shy away from emphasizing believing. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 2 says this, For unto us was the gospel preached. So that word was preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them. Why? Yeah. Because it wasn't mixed with faith in them that heard it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them, but the word preached. And by the way, the word preached there, another one of those, it's good if you can get to the original languages, because the word there, it's not, it's a, it's a different word than was used in 1 Corinthians. It, it's actually a word for hearing. It, it's kind of a strange word. It's not actually the word hear, but it's related to that. In other words, they heard it. 
It wasn't that the word didn't get to them. It's not the gospel wasn't put out before. You guys sit and hear the gospel every week and you sometimes get bored by it. You guys, I'm speaking very generally here. Guys, maybe I should say, maybe, maybe I should say people. So you don't think I'm focusing in too much on you individually. But I think we do need to focus in on ourselves and ask ourselves, how am I hearing the gospel? How am I hearing it? Am I hearing it with faith? A am I being drawn to the gospel? Am I really believing the gospel? In the three verses, the two verses that we've already looked at, for Romans 1.16, 1 Corinthians 1.21, you see the word believing. It is the power of God unto everyone who believes. And then in Ephesians 1 and verse 19, listen to this. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe? According to the working of his mighty power, who is it toward? It's toward those who believe. Now the word believe in Romans 1, 16. This is, this is important. 1 Corinthians 1, 21. Ephesians 1.19, every one of those places, the form of the word used is called a present active participle. I know you don't like grammar and English and all those parts of speech, right? But it's critical. A present active participle tells us that a condition is being described, and it's an ongoing condition that is being described. It can be a noun, it can be an adjective, it's not a verb. A verbal, it can act as a verb. And that's what's going on. In other words, believing isn't something that I did at that revival meeting. Believing isn't something that I did when some preacher led me in a prayer. Believing is something that I do. I, it is condition of my life now. I am believing the gospel. Does this describe you? Why is this important? Because we're talking about the power of God in my life. Why is it that there is so little power in the lives of many professing Christians and sometimes in my life and sometimes in your life? Why do we struggle like we do? I believe and there are other answers to that question, but one of the fundamental answers is this. We are not believing the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation and all that that means to everyone who is believing, the believing ones, daily believing the gospel. Now listen, daily believing the gospel will not cause our peace with God. That's settled. Where is that settled? It's settled at the cross. It's settled in Christ. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And you can rejoice and exult in that from now to the day you die. But you won't if you are not believing the gospel. You are practically going to get separated from that reality. And it's going to practically affect you in negative ways. But if you are being attracted to and drawn to every day, thinking the gospel, musing upon the gospel, we're going to find our sense of peace, our sense of joy, our sanctification increasing. And it's directly related to believing the gospel. And so, and you've heard this said before, we need to daily preach the gospel to ourselves. And what we're doing tonight is reminding ourselves of this reality. We need the gospel. We need Christ crucified and risen. We need the power of Christ. We need him. Muse upon Christ. And, the, and listen, if you get bored musing upon Christ, something's desperately wrong. I would suggest to you that you need the Holy Spirit's help to muse upon Christ properly. 
your flesh won't succeed in that. Why don't you ask him? Why don't you ask him tomorrow morning? This, this fellow here, a practice that he put, he put gospel realities on three by five cards. He was a preacher and had a crisis in his life. And he just put gospel truths on three by five cards and every single day he just put these gospel realities before his mind and he said eventually it was life changing for him. Why? It's the power of God. The gospel. It's the power of God. And you've got to be in a believing relationship with that gospel which means you've got to be thinking upon the gospel. That's why I say, don't compartmentalize, don't isolate, don't, what we're doing tonight, this is, you know, a sort of a religious thing in my life, but it's really not my life. No, Christ must be your life, your life, your life. The gospel. Are you finding rest for your soul in Christ? Are you trying to find rest for your soul in activity, in doing? Do you get really bogged down and worn down in your spirit because you're not doing, you're not doing, you're not doing, you're not doing? How, what is it, what is it that brings that joy and that peace and that sanctification in your life? It ought to be flowing from the power of the gospel. More can be said about this, but believing the gospel will change you and it will keep changing you from glory to glory. I'm just introducing that thought to you tonight. It's not new. Maybe for some of you, it's just being you're being reminded of it. Maybe for others of you, you're seeing something in a fresh way. I hope you are. If you will believe the gospel, your life will not be the same. You say, well, I do believe. You don't understand what I'm saying. I'm talking about believing. I know about living in the faith of the gospel. The faith of Christ. Living. For to me to live is, is Christ. Is Christ. I'm crucified with Christ. That interesting, Paul puts pen to letter in the thing. He can never, he can't get away from Jesus Christ. He can't get away from him. That should be true for you and me. If we're believing the gospel, Jesus, I'm resting, resting in the joy of what thou art. I'm finding out the greatness of thy loving heart. Thou hast bid me gaze upon thee, and thy beauty fills my soul. For by thy transforming power, thou hast made me whole. Oh, how great thy loving kindness, vaster, broader, than the sea. Oh, how marvelous thy goodness lavished all on me. Yes, I rest in thee, beloved. Know what wealth of grace is thine. Know thy certainty of promise and have made it mine. Simply trusting thee, Lord Jesus, I behold thee as thou art and thy love so pure, so changeless satisfies my heart. Satisfies its deepest longings. Meat supplies its every need, compasseth me round with blessings. Thine is love indeed. Ever lift thy face upon me as I work and wait for thee, resting neath thy smile, Lord Jesus. Earth's dark shadows flee. Brightness of my Father's glory. Sunshine of my Father's face. Keep me ever trusting. Resting, fill me with thy grace. Jesus, I am resting, resting in the joy of what thou art. I am finding out the greatness 
of thy loving heart. Believing the gospel. I know, it sounds simplistic, doesn't it? It really is simple. Sometimes we complicate things. It really is simple. But I'm going to tell you something. The forces of evil and your own flesh in this world will do everything possible to separate you from the gospel. And you will fall if you give in. And that's why it's so important for you to believe and keep on believing. And that's why it's so important in those moments as I had one this last week where I felt absolutely dead to the gospel. I had to cry out to God. Help me. Help me. I want to see the beauty of Christ. I need to see what right now at this moment I feel disconnected from. And you know what? He answered. He answered. You say right in the mo in that moment? And no, it wasn't actually right in that moment. But he answered. In that day, he answered. Why wouldn't he? Our Father wants you to rejoice in the beauty of his Son, doesn't he? And the promise of the Father is the Holy Spirit who indwells you. He's not going to refuse a request like that. You want to see more of the beauty and the glory of his son? He's not going to say, I don't think so. He's going to say, I'm glad you, I don't want to humanize this, but my thoughts are, I'm glad you asked. In fact, isn't that what Jesus said? If a father who is evil knows how to give good gifts, how much more my father in heaven so why not tonight ask? Why not ask? Why not as we pause right now? Why not ask? I want to see more of you, Lord Jesus. Help me. Help me. And then rest in what he shows you of himself. You, see, I, you might say, think, I, don't, I wish I could see as much as whoever. Keep looking. That person who sees whatever he or she sees hasn't always seen what he or she sees. Sees, It was a growing process. So keep growing. Keep looking. Keep seeing. Keep loving. Keep receiving everything he has to give to his children. And I believe he's going to give us something tonight as we partake of the bread and the cup together. Father, I thank you.